Hello everybody and welcome back to Revolutionary Left Radio. On today's episode, I have back on the program for the third time the wonderful historian Peter Cole to talk about a book he wrote in 2006 and 7, but has now released just this month, a second edition, which expands the book almost twice its original size um, with brand new documentation, etc. And that book is Ben Fletcher, The Life and Times of a Black Wobbly. Um, this is a, an undercovered uh, figure in, in labor history and black liberation history and socialist history in this country. And it was a figure that I myself was not even fully aware of. And so being able to prep for this episode and have this wonderful conversation with Peter, um, I think is, is wonderful. And I want to extend and promote the life and legacy of Ben Fletcher. Um, and this, this work by Peter is, is really an essential part of doing that. And then on the show, we, we pump it out to tens of thousands of more people. He really is a figure that needs to be remembered on the left, honored on the left. And at the end of this episode, we talk about how Ben Fletcher died. And because he was poor when he died, he was buried in an unmarked grave. And right now, the, the Wobblies in, in uh, New York are trying to campaign to get um, a, a marker at his grave. And uh, that campaign will, will start taking donations possibly in the next month or two. When it does, we'll make that known on all of our platforms and try to get the Rev Left audience to, to pitch in. Um, and then maybe beyond even that, we, we can they can think about moving towards uh, finding some sort of memorial, um, founding some sort of memorial to Ben Fletcher and his life in his original city of, of Philadelphia. So, you know, keeping the, the, the memory and the legacy of figures like Ben Fletcher alive is one of the, you know, really the, the core tenets of, of this program. You know, we want to tell proletarian history, black history, the history of people who have always fought back against white supremacy, against capitalism, against imperialism, and so often because the victors give the history of these things, these figures and these events and these movements are often whitewashed or completely suppressed. And so, you know, we're playing our humble role in, in, in reversing that, that travesty. And in this episode, we're focusing on the wonderful Glenn Fletcher. So I hope everybody not only enjoys this conversation, but goes out, supports Peter Cole's work. And when that campaign comes up to, uh, to get him a, a proper grave marking, I'll be sure that every single one of you know about it. So without further ado, let's get into this wonderful episode um, with historian Peter Cole on his book, Ben Fletcher, The Life and Times of a Black Wobbler. Well, hello there. My name is Peter Cole. I am a history professor. I work at a place called Western Illinois University. That's in a small town between St. Louis and Chicago. Um, I also am the founder and co-director of the Chicago Race Riot of 1919 Commemoration Project, and I'm very happy to be on the show today. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely, Peter, and it's great to have you back. You've been on uh, two other times on our episode on dock worker power, as well as our, our big episode on the IWW and the history of it overall. So this is your third time coming back on the show. It's always an honor and a pleasure to have you on. And today we are talking about a book you wrote a while ago, but that has now been released as a second edition with some with some more um, content that we'll get into in a bit. And that book, again, is called Ben Fletcher, The Life and Times of a Black Wobbly. So I'm really excited to have you on and to dive into to the life of, of this important historical figure. But first and foremost, um, whenever we're recording an episode in the wake of a, of a big historical political event in this society, which seems to happen every other week these days, um, I like to just ask the guests sort of, their thoughts on, on what's happening and, and any sort of reflections that they might have about that particular event. So as we're sitting right now, this is a few days after the fascist riot on, on Capitol Hill, and we're still very much living in the in the immediate wake of that. A lot of questions are still unanswered, but I just wanted to sort of see how you took that event as it was happening. Were you at all surprised about it? And if you have just any general thoughts on, on what happened there. Well, I was sickened, but not surprised by what happened on January 6th in Washington, D.C. Uh, many of us have been waiting for this sort of action to happen. Um, but truly, I mean, I'm a historian. The history of America is soaked in this sort of racism mm -hmm. and anti-democratic tendencies. Um, but I could say just quickly, um, you know, part of it reminds me of Germany in the late 1920s and early 1930s, which were the years leading up to the election of Adolf Hitler, but then the seizure of power after that. But, you know, we don't have to look overseas. Um, for people who don't know much about the history of America in the 19th century, the period right after the Civil War Reconstruction is really one of the least known and understood 
parts. Um, in 1873, which is eight years after the Civil War ended, in Colfax, Louisiana, armed white supremacists um, seized control of the local government from elected black officials. The next year in New Orleans, um, then uh, the capital of Louisiana, a group called the White League tried to overthrow the Louisiana state government. Um, and a monument stood actually to that 1864 insurrection until 2017 when the mayor of New Orleans had it taken down. Um, or in 1898, yeah, in Wilmington, North Carolina on the coast, which was then the biggest city in North Carolina, armed whites, including a former congressman, actually successfully overthrew a biracial elected government and forced out the last known congressman who was black from uh, the South. And it wouldn't be another 70 years until an African-American was elected from the South to represent um, anywhere in the former Confederacy. Yeah? Um, and so like all of these connect events have happened. Um, and although some people think of this as the past, quote unquote, I mean, I'm a historian, I, I essentially see no disconnect. Mm -hmm. The past is never dead. That's what William Faulkner wrote. Um, but if I may, I also would wish to say one other thing, which is that, you know, quote unquote, working class whites are far too often blamed for Donald Trump's support. And um, I want to push back on that a little. I wouldn't suggest that there are not any men and women who are white who are non-elite um, support Trump. That's obviously false. But who can take time off from work? <laughs> of course, who even has a job? Who can fly to Washington, D.C. Um, and stay at a hotel right, for several nights? These aren't working class people who are actually, uh, what I'm seeing from Illinois is that some of the people who traveled there were people actually who were um, managers, executives, mm -hmm. right, at corporations. Um, and so this narrative that we have sort of poor whites and working class whites to blame for Trump, uh, obviously there's some support there, but um, really Trump's support has always come from the top, right? I mean, it's only uh, in the aftermath of the insurrection's failure that corporations sort of suddenly are fleeing support of Trump, but they're very happy to support him when he was delivering tax cuts and deregulation. And so to me, um, Trump support has always come from the um, really sort of capitalist class who may not like some of the things he tweets, but actually were quiet for four years. Um, and so I'm always focused on who's got power. And so for me, um, the fall of Trump is of course wonderful, but um, I do think that it was uh, sort of supported by those who had tremendous power and therefore um, also benefited tremendously from the last four years, um, not just white people, but generally people with wealth. And so for me, that's the, the takeaway. They uh, may not have liked the way this insurrection looked, but in fact, you know, guys in suits were then still willing to defend Trump even after the failure of um, January 6th. So those are some of my incoherent thoughts on that subject. Yeah, no, I think they're they're very coherent and they're important. Um, we just released an episode on both Red Menace and Rev Left where we sort of you know gave our thoughts on that. And one of the things that we highlighted on the event was precisely what you're saying. And this is true historically. It was true in Nazi Germany, et cetera, is that the, the primary class base of fascism is not the working class, but it's actually the, the petit bourgeois. And, and, and in concert with elements of the big bourgeoisie and the elites, the, the, the initial lie of election fraud was an elite thing. It was is handed down to this this middle strata um, from people like Cruz and Hawley and Trump and Rudy and McConnell. Um, they all went along with it. Lindsey Graham, too. You know, they all went along with it. So it was a, it was an elite lie. But the forces that came really or that led the class forces that led the uh, the riot, the insurrection were we're that petty bourgeois sort of middle strata. And, and this is not just speculation. This is actually borne out by the people who have now been identified. These were uh, One of them was the son of a Supreme Court judge. One was a, a state-level lawmaker. The lady who was shot and killed owned a, a pool cleaning business. The red robe lady was a family medicine doctor. There were retired Navy vets who were a part of this. The guy who was sitting in Nancy Pelosi's desk was an independent contractor who got a $10,000 PPE loan earlier this year due to COVID. So, you know, and, and right before the night before on the streets as they were being interviewed, uh, one guy was yelling into the camera, you know, we are the business leaders. And he wasn't lying. And and if we look back over this summer, um, the, the, the reaction from 
the right against Black Lives Matter and a bunch of other, you know, left wing movements. I mean, these are people in 60, 70, 80 thousand dollar pickup trucks, you know, Trump's beautiful boaters. These are people with enough disposable income to buy boats and take them out with 17 flags hooked on them. This is not the poor working class, as you said. And so making that point and driving that home is really important. And I think it's one of the liberal centrist lies that are that are pushed is that this is a white working class thing, which just further stigmatizes lower class people and doesn't actually take account of the actual class forces at play. And the other big liberal lie that we've been hearing in the wake of this is that this is not who we are. And as a historian, you just laid out several instances and there could be many more added um, that this is exactly who America is. And this is something that is not new, but in, in fact, woven into the very fabric of this society. So uh, those are definitely um, some wonderful and important thoughts. And it leads well into into this topic because Ben Fletcher, although just an individual, is also a stand-in for a bigger historical movement, um, a black liberation, socialism, labor movement. Um, and so, you know, focusing on him in, in the wake of this, I think, is actually fairly timely. Um, so with that, all that said, let's go ahead and dive into the main topic, which is this wonderful book centered around this, this important figure, Ben Fletcher. So for those who may not know, who was Ben Fletcher and, and why is he an important historical figure in not only the labor movement, but the socialist movement and the black liberation movement in this country overall? Yeah, of course, Fletcher and many of us would combine those things into one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but Ben Fletcher was born in 1890. He was uh, African American, uh, born and raised in Philadelphia. Um, his parents had uh, moved from Virginia um, before he was born to the city of Philadelphia. And I could talk a little more about that in a second. But so Fletcher, um, in his early 20s, became a member of the Industrial Workers of the World, the IWW, uh, nicknamed the Wobblies. And Fletcher, um, was a leader in Philadelphia, then the third biggest city in the country, um, in the IWW, and then in 1913, when dock workers in the port of Philadelphia went on strike, um, he and other Wobblies organized them into a new chapter of the IWW um, called Local 8, not the eighth local in the entire IWW, but perhaps in the Marine Transport Workers Industrial Union. Um, and um, starting in May of 1913, Fletcher became a member of and a leader in Local 8. And Local 8 was um, a union of, say, 4,000 or so men, at that time all men in the workforce in that industry, who were roughly one-third African-American, one-third, say, Irish and Irish-American, and one-third East Europeans. And this was, I suggest, and I still believe it, um, the most integrated union of its generation, interracial, multi-ethnic, um, and committed to socialism. Uh, the IWW was, and actually still is, committed to a socialist world and believes that capitalism is essentially the ultimate um, problem in, 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 in America and the world. Yeah. And so in 1905, when the IWW was founded, it was um, committed to sort of a, um, using industrial unions as the, the pathway towards socialism. And Fletcher, therefore, becomes a black leader in a multiracial branch of the IWW that was the most powerful example of what the IWW's ideas could turn into action. Mm. Um, and then for about 10 years, um, this union dominated the waterfront in Philadelphia, despite massive racism, despite massive anti-unionism, despite massive persecution, especially during World War I, um, as well as rival unions. And so um, for those of us who believe in socialism, but also in an anti-racist country and world, this is actually what it looks like, yeah, uh, with a black leader, Fletcher, um, who was widely known and respected by his peers at the time, even if largely forgotten since. Um, and uh, so for, well, I know we'll talk about it more later, but, you know, if you're interested in the 21st century anti-racist labor movement and socialist movement, then actually studying what it looked like in action, um, to me, is sort of obvious, but of course I'm a historian, so I always feel that way. Um, but uh, I think there's a lot of lessons that can be learned from the life of Fletcher, but also from the union that he was a leader and a part of for many years. Yeah, wonderful. And just out of a little sort of an aside, in my own curiosity, how did you initially become interested in Ben Fletcher? And why do you think that he's not as well known of a, of a figure on, on the left that he, he should be? Do you have any reasons why that might be? So... I became interested in Ben Fletcher when I was a graduate student in 
um, the early 1990s, mid 1990s in Washington DC. And I read a book that's still in a way the best survey of the IWW in the US called We Shall Be All by a historian named Melvin Dubosquian. There is just a sentence in this book um, about Ben Fletcher, literally a sentence um, in this 400 page book. And it was noted that he was only African American among the IWW leadership who had been arrested and, and put on trial in Chicago in 1918 for crimes against the state. And I'm like, who is this man? Um, because I already was interested in sort of in my, I guess I could say my political view. I was, I very much believe that the labor movement was the best way forward to redistributing wealth downward, um, even within the system or, or to sort of overturn the system. And um, in America, that means that you also have to grapple with the sort of central paradox, which is that we live in a society committed to equality yet fails to achieve that horribly so. Um, and so I was interested in interracial unions and as a history grad student, I was looking for examples. But the sad truth is, is that before really the 1930s, um, there are very few. Um, and so when I came across Fletcher, I'm like, whoa, he, who is this person and what is this union local eight that he was a leader in? And, um, you know, my ignorance about his existence is the norm, even among historians, right? Um, uh, so why is it that um, local eight and Ben Fletcher are not even well known among historians, let alone radicals or ordinary Americans? I don't think it's a conspiracy, but I do think that, um, you know, the IWW generally is sort of under appreciated for its radicalism, but also for its impact and influence in the, especially in the first few decades of the 1900s. Um, I also think that the subsequent rise of the Communist Party is an anti-racist force in the US, um, that they sort of like captured the wind, um, if you will. It wasn't, a, like I said, a sort of some conspiracy on the part of the communists in that case. but. Um, Nevertheless, like too many people, and I should also say this is the case in other countries too, where the communists have been given credit for being more anti-racist than other forces or parties, but they often were not the first. Um, they're actually built upon it a longer tradition on the left. And in the case of the US, that includes the IWW. Um, and so I think it's partially because the, uh, the CP in the 1930s and 40s and then the CIO, which is this big labor movement, really sort of took our attention away from these earlier times. Yeah, um, I of course have been spending the last 20 years trying to change that uh, in a small way. And so I very much appreciate having the, your podcast to sort of amplify this, this, this message. Absolutely, yeah. And we're happy to have you on. It's a, it's a perfect match and, and we definitely appreciate that. So yeah, I was, I was actually, you know, pretty much oblivious to the existence of him either. And as I started reading your work and, and, and prepping for this episode, I was just sort of, you know, flabbergasted and ashamed that I had never really heard of, much less knew anything about of uh, this this really important figure. So, and, and just for anybody listening who hasn't listened to our other episodes um, with with Peter Cole, I'll link to them in the show notes so you can find them. And I think if you take all three of the the instances in which Peter's come on the show and listen to all three of those episodes, you'll have a really really profound understanding of, of the IWW. Um, the labor movements and how it's been tied with black liberation, et cetera. So um, I, I see this as sort of a little series in, in a sense. But having a, having addressed that, let's let's move on and just going back to to Ben's childhood. Uh, this is this is somebody who was born in the 1800s, lived I think until 1949. So can you talk a little bit about Ben's childhood and his his younger life and sort of how he he came to to be radicalized? Yeah, of course. He was born in 1890. His name is Benjamin Harrison Fletcher. Um, the president at the time was named Benjamin Harrison, and almost all African Americans were members of the Republican Party because it was the party of Lincoln. And so his parents named him after the sitting Republican president. Yeah, Ben Fletcher, Ben Harrison Fletcher, although he always went by Ben. Um, his parents, you know, we know almost nothing about his parents. They both were migrants to Philadelphia, but um, they were therefore fleeing basically the Jim Crow South, right? Um, sort of the post reconstruction rise of um, a white supremacist or a resumption of white supremacy in the South, you could say. We don't even know for sure, I don't even know for sure what his, whether his parents were enslaved or not, but the odds are coming from Virginia and born before 1860 that his parents were probably enslaved, but he makes no mention of that. Um, sadly, very little is known about his childhood. Um, we don't even know 
Well, I mean, did he graduate from high school, right? Probably not. Um, we do know a lot, though, about the place that he lived in and the sorts of um, experiences he would have had. So Philadelphia was the third biggest city in the country at that time, New York, Chicago, then Philadelphia. Um, it was a mighty industrial city. It's um, at the confluence of two rivers, the Delaware and the Schuylkill, which is why William Penn, the Quaker who founded the colony given to him by the English crown um, located it there. So it's a port city, even though it's not on the ocean, right? Um, and uh, it is pretty diverse, although not as diverse as Pittsburgh or Chicago or New York City. Um, there was actually a large black population in Philadelphia in the late 19th century, had been for some time. It was the largest black city outside of the South, and it's just outside of the South. Um, it was uh, the place where, for instance, the African Methodist Ch Episcopal Church, the AME Church, the first black church in America was founded, for example. Right? And so there's an old black community, um, of course, in the 19 teens, during World War I and after uh, the so-called Great Migration began, that resulted in a influx. But so Fletcher's parents preceded that, right? Like um, we know that uh, xenophobia was rampant, um, but also that there's a decent number of immigrants in Philadelphia, especially Italians, especially Southern Italians, um, a lot of Eastern European Jews, um, but a variety of others, a lot of Irish. And we know the place where he lived, but now it's called South Philly or South Philadelphia, um, would have been uh, poor and working class people, but also actually some rich people. We know actually from census records that he lived on the same streets as white people. And so in other words, residential segregation in Philadelphia did not exist yet. It actually would happen in the 20th century, but not in his childhood, right? Like, uh, and we would have known that he would have basically walked the streets of this relatively very old city um, in the US, old city, right? Um, and uh, it was on the streets of Philadelphia, right? Um, where he was born and raised and then across the Delaware River in Camden, New Jersey. His family lived there for a little while too. Um, you know, his mother died when um, uh, he was in his teens, although not why. Um, he, you know, he had uh, four siblings, right? Um, and uh, was generally a renter, right? And because again, census records tell us that he was a lodger as opposed to say an owner of the, the place, right? Um, uh, and, and we know that his parents were originally from Virginia, right? And so those are the sorts of details that we know about this milieu that he lived in that was actually pretty diverse, um, where um, working class people would have walked around, um, even though there were streetcars, you could save five cents by walking, because the city is not physically large. Um, and we would have guessed that he likely would have um, worked on the waterfront as a teenager, because thousands of men were working on the waterfronts of the city. And you, although there are some skills involved in dock work, um, there's actually some jobs that simply require a, a strong back and the willingness to suffer pain, right? Um, and that uh, because black people in particular were denied most other jobs, um, the waterfront was one of the few occupations open to black men in the uh, early 1900s. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. So so the part about radicalization may, may come in well with this next question, because it's basically a question about when and how did, did Ben eventually come to be aware of and then eventually join the IWW and what were his sort of specific talents that, that set him apart from others of his time? Yeah, so Fletcher, um, you know, like with a lot, I mean, I, I literally wrote a book on Ben Fletcher and I can't even answer some questions that may seem very basic, which tells us a lot about how hard it is to recover the lives of non-elite people mm -hmm. um, in the past, right? And so you know, we know around 1910 or at the latest 1911, he belonged to the IWW. Um, he starts to show up in newspapers and IWW publications by 1912, right? Um, we know he probably almost certainly also joined the Socialist Party of the United States at that time, which is interesting. Um, it would have actually been common for leftists to potentially join both the IWW and the Socialist Party at that time. One of the founders of the IWW was Eugene Debs, who was the leader of the Socialist Party. And Big Bill Haywood, another famous wobbly was among the leadership in the Socialist Party. Although in the um, late part of the first decade and then the early 19 teens, there was a rift between the IWW and the Socialists. Um, socialists generally believing in an evolutionary or democratic path towards um, socialism, i.e. electoralism, um, whereas the IWW increasingly rejected electoral means as a path um, towards it. But so Fletcher would have been you know, around 20 years old, right? open-minded as many young people are, and was probably exploring. Right? Um, how he learned about the IWW, we don't know, but I suspect that he was just walking down the street, right? Because at that time, it was very common for Wobbly and other 
activists to organize street events, um, literally standing on a quote soapbox unquote, which is basically just a wooden box that you would stand on in order to be higher than the crowd. On a, you might stand on a busy street corner and talk and or and have say some of your comrades distribute literature. The Wobblies did this all over the country and the world, but they weren't the only ones. And so it's actually quite reasonable to suspect that Fletcher was um, walking down the street and heard someone speaking and maybe the next day came back and saw them again and maybe stopped and listened and was convinced he subsequently became a very well-known soapbox orator himself, right? And so it's um, very early on, even when he's maybe just 22, before Local Aid is founded, he's already being reported upon in IWW's papers as being a very dynamic street speaker and organizer, right? Um, because you could organize people in various ways, maybe your coworkers on the job, or you might try to organize people in other workplaces, right? Um, and so I think it was more the latter for Fletcher, right? That um, he was starting to organize. And at that time, the IWW consisted primarily of European immigrants. And so he probably was a very unusual black man in meetings that very likely were people who are European immigrants or European Americans, um, even though he later came to organize a um, workforce stock workers that were heavily black, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, his talents in particular are seen as being, um, it's repeatedly commented upon over the course of decades um, uh, that he's considered a really brilliant speaker, right? Um, we also can read his writings, although they're limited in number, um, and see that he's seems to be very smart and thoughtful, even though he doesn't have much formal education. Um, it was actually quite common for working class people, especially maritime workers, to have a lot of free time when they didn't have work. Um, and what did he do? Well, this is even before radio exists, let alone other forms of mass communication. And so um, everyone was a reader. Yeah, um, of course, now we podcast, but um, <laughs> he wouldn't have had that option, right? Um, and so what set him apart at the time was really, he's considered to be straight away a great speaker. He is at that time also um, the only prominent African-American in Philadelphia and one of the few black wobblies in the country. And so he shows up at the 1912 and 13 national conventions, for example, and is um, shown respect, but also written about in reports about the events, right? And so um, he's only 22, right? 23 wow. years old at this time. Um, and so I often compare him, as I'll talk about maybe later, to Fred Hampton, who was 20, 21 years old um, in the late 1960s in Chicago when he was a leader of the Black Panthers, right? And so we might think about him in those sorts of ways, that he's, he's a leader of a revolutionary organization, in this case, a revolutionary labor union. Um, he's a dynamic speaker and he's brave. Um, he regularly is sent into situations that are dangerous. As a black man, he's always at risk of being lynched. Um, that may seem like an exaggeration, but you know, literally hundreds of black men were lynched every year in America in the 19-teens. Um, and in one instance in Norfolk, Virginia in 1917 that I highlight in my book, um, he was threatened directly with a lynching um, for when he was trying to organize black um, dock workers in the port of Norfolk, Virginia, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, and lastly, I would say he's also repeatedly praised for being funny. Um, now, people who are speakers know that humor goes a long way towards um, attracting and keeping an audience's attention, right? It's also often an example of intelligence, I say. Um, although we might laugh at stupid people, most comedians are really smart, right? Um, you have to be in order to be clever with words in these ways. And so those are some of, I think, his characteristics that um, made him an effective organizer for the IWW. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. I really love the analogy to Fred Hampton. Uh, the, the the youth is always profound to me. As I get older, it just becomes more and more um, profound to me. I mean, like I always mention how young many of the founding members of the Black Panther Party were, for example. These are people in their late teens, early 20s for the most part. As you said, Hampton himself organized throughout his teens and was assassinated at the young age of, of 21, but not before making his mark on this country and this world. Um, and then at, speaking to his his sense of humor. One of the things I came across just in my prep work was um, the IWW leader, Big Bill Haywood, who were friends with him. And this is during the sentencing uh, process after the indictments, which we'll get into in a couple questions. Um, but Bill Haywood said that, you know, Ben Fletcher sidled over to me and said, the judge has been using very ungrammatical language. I looked at his smiling black face and asked, how's that, Ben? He said, his sentences are much too long. So even in the context of, of sitting in front of a judge and facing down years in prison, 
Um, he was still able to, to crack jokes and make the people around him laugh. And that really is a fundamental part of being a good orator, a good communicator, is being able to to make people laugh and to, to have that connection with people. Um, and so that's a, that's a huge part of, of his personality and his success, absolutely. Um, so moving on, we, we mentioned a little bit earlier how he was a, a member and a leader of the Local 8. Can you talk a bit more about this union, uh, sort of its dynamics and, and the role that he played within it? It's my pleasure. So um, for people who may have listened to my episode with you on dock worker power, I've spent a lot of my life as an adult, even though I'm not a dock worker, thinking about and studying and writing about dock workers. Um, we do have to understand that this sort of work is really important to sort of get, right? Like um, it is the sort of occupation that um, is both deeply exploited by employers um, because there's a sort of for the most basic reason, there's generally a labor surplus, right? And so wages get driven down um, because there's a lot of people who could potentially do this work. Just think about all the people like Ben Fletcher's family who are moving to the city, black and white rural Americans, um, who then need to find work, as well as all these people coming off ships. And again, Philadelphia was a port city, right? Um, who are looking for work, right? As well as those who already live in a city with a large population. And so the labor surplus, which was the norm, um, is one of the easiest ways for bosses to exploit, right? Also the fact that bosses had somewhat intentionally created a multi-ethnic workforce wasn't because they were generous and progressive, mm -hmm. but because they knew that the quickest way to um, weaken workers was to divide them, and that um, ethnicity and race don't just come in terms of prejudice from the top, but also comes from below. In other words, that there is white working class Americans who are both racist and xenophobic, um, for better or worse. And so um, we are mindful that uh, this industry is actually deeply exploitative. Workers are poor. It's incredibly dangerous work. Literally, you can die on the job any single day, right? Um, and that the hiring system is even nicknamed the shape up was um, very exploitative, right? So that um, hundreds might show up for a job and only dozens might get hired. And then you have to wait till you find another work. This is sometimes called casual labor. Now we often use the term precarious or contingent. Um, but so in this is the industry that Fletcher organized. So in May of 1913, dock workers went on strike. Um, despite all the oppression that they face, dock work also has um, embedded into it some collective action potential because people work together in gangs and groups to load and unload ships. And so the work itself develops a collective identity. These workers go on strike in order to get a raise. Um, during the strike, the IWW moves in to try to um, basically help organize. They, uh, when they do so, they quickly create a, a strike committee that has representatives of every single um, nationality and ethnic group in it. Um, they, the Wobblies did this in other places, famously in Lawrence, Massachusetts, the Bread and Roses strike from 1912. They did the same sort of thing with a very diverse workforce. They made sure that all the workers of different groups um, uh, had a seat at the table, literally. Right? Like, uh, so they created institutions that um, reflected what the workforce looked like. Right? Um, after the strike won, um, uh, or it was victorious, I should say, in, in May of 1913, right, um, then Local 8 becomes uh, a very powerful force. So, for example, they integrate the docks. What do I mean by I say that? Before this time, employers usually used ethnically and racially segregated gangs, a Polish gang, an Irish gang, a black gang. Those gangs are literally played off of each other um, and basically pushed to work ever faster. Oh, look at those Polish people there. They must be stronger than you. Come on, Irish guys, don't you have the same strength as those Poles, right? Um, and so they integrate the gangs, right? Of course, how do you break down racism? You actually have to know people who are different than you, right? Um, they get rid of the shape up, the system of hiring that had existed. They instead, um, employers will have to call up the union hall and request workers be sent. They also institute a system where um, members who have paid their dues, which are actually very low, but um, if you've paid your monthly dues, you wear the, the appropriate button for that month. That button basically is a pass, right? Um, anyone who doesn't have that button shouldn't be hired by a boss. However, of course, bosses don't like the union anyway. They might try to get away with it. Who's going to enforce? Not a so-called business agent, as they're referred to in unions um, today, but instead um, the other workers. And so time and time again, most of these are undocumented. Workers would walk off the docks when employers tried to hire non-wobblies, not uh, members who are not in good standing in local aid. Right? Um, they also integrated their leadership ranks by mandating essentially black and white elected leaders and their social events. 
right? And so they immediately did voluntarily, um, although very much in keeping with their views, um, a fully in integrated ethnically, racially, and nationally union, right? Um, and really, as I already said, the best way to sort of overcome xenophobia and racism is, is for workers to see that they share more in common than different, um, which is actually only by working together literally and within their union, right? And so, and Fletcher was the most prominent black, but also the most prominent leader period in local eight. Um, and so what this union did from 1913 until almost the end of 1922 was something that almost no other workforce, other institution in the United States did. This is 50 years before the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, and this, is, this work front was segregated because of employers. The union forced integration and they did it, the last thing I'll say, is without a contract, because the Wobblies believed that the most important tool of workers was to strike. Wobblies and other workers might still believe this. And so um, if you sign a contract, most union contracts in the US have a no strike clause. Not all of them do, but most do. And uh, the Wobblies said, we don't want to sign a contract because you're, we're giving away basically our most powerful weapon. Right? And so there's a lot of examples of Wobblies trying to force changes to improvements to their wages, conditions, et cetera, through the threat of or an actual strike. And so it's not surprising for all these reasons why bosses hated them, um, but it's important to understand how impressive this was, but also how unusual it was. Um, you would not have found almost any other union at this time doing these sorts of things other than the IWW. Yeah, wow, absolutely fascinating, fascinating history. I know we've talked about it a little bit. We've mentioned some some figures and, and some organizations, but can you talk a little bit more about the, the friendships, associations, and links with other radicals of the time that, that Ben had? Yeah, of course. Well, so Fletcher, of course, lives in Philadelphia, right? And Philadelphia is a big city. So that means sort of prominent radicals pass through the city periodically, right? Um, and so when in terms of locals, right, um, well, the other leaders of Local 8, we know also were his friends, a man named Jack Walsh, who was an Irish American wobbly, um, a man named E.F. Dory, whose um, parents were French and, 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 and Swedish immigrants, um, uh, a man named Walter Neff, who was a German Swiss immigrant. Um, Walsh, Dory and Neff, along with Fletcher, are really the, the leaders of Local 8 for most of this time. Um, but also with Manuel Ray, who was a Spanish anarchist and wobbly, um, and a sailor who made Philadelphia his home, right? Um, and so um, these are some of his Philadelphia friends. We know from the records, right, that um, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, uh, the quote unquote rebel girl, Big Bill Haywood, um, John Reed, nicknamed Jack Reed, who wrote um, 10 Days That Shook the World and later became a uh, communist um, and uh, died actually far too young, um, but uh, knew him. Joe Hill, the famous wobbly bard um, songwriter, might have known um, Ben Fletcher, um, other Matilda Rabinowitz, who was a, a sort of a radical Jewish wobbly and union leader, especially in the needle trades in garments. Um, you know, was a friend of his. Later in life, um, in the 1930s and 40s, he became good friends with Sam Dolgoff um, and his wife Esther, who were Jewish anarchists and wobblies who lived in New York City um, and were among the, his closest friends for his later years. Yeah, um, we also know, thanks to his prison records, because he was thrown in prison, which I know we'll talk about more, mm -hmm. um, we can see who he corresponded with, um, because the government kept tracks of every inmate's letters, right? And so we know that he wrote regularly to um, Chandler Owen and A. Philip Randolph, who were um, black socialists in Harlem, um, and William Monroe Trotter, who was a prominent black newspaper man in Boston, and other black radicals, um, as well as, of course, family and others. Yeah, and so he would have been friends with and associated with really every prominent wobbly period, right? And then, of course, once he goes, gets thrown into prison, which um, someone referred to Leavenworth at the time as the University of Radicalism, because there were so many radicals thrown into the federal pen after World War I, um, that he was respected by his peers along the way to, um, including, like you mentioned earlier, um, Haywood, um, on multiple occasions, offered praise to Fletcher um, in print, right? Like all of this we know, thanks to the written record, we don't have any, sadly, there's no oral his, um, evidence, no archival or recordings of his voice. Yeah. 
Absolutely interesting. And and as you mentioned at the end there, the the irony of of prisons and particularly the irony of of putting a bunch of political people in prison for their political activity is that it often spurs and develops that that political activity. And that was true of like, you know, figures like the IRA. I mean, you know, there's there's instances of of members of the IRA reading France Fanon's Wretched of the Earth while in prison. Same goes for many of the Black Panthers who were in prison. Malcolm X famously um, went through a a major transformation uh, within prison. And uh, so that's just uh, something that's interesting and worth pointing out. And then just all of the people that you mentioned, you know, all of which could probably have their own episodes on this program. It just really reminds you that everybody today fighting for these things, right, fighting for egalitarianism, fighting against white supremacy, fighting for basic human emancipation. We have this long, beautiful tradition and humans in every single generation who, you know, carried that torch forward. And in many ways, we all today humbly pick up that torch and carry it forward in our own ways. Um, That history has largely been written out of mainstream You know, versions of history, those figures have often been suppressed. Uh, Our knowledge of them have been suppressed. And so that's why it's so important for, you know, left wing people in general to have their own outlets that we can tell our own stories, do our own history and not have to rely on, you know, the ideology of the ruling class to hand us down fractured fragments of history, erasing the parts of it that we so desperately need to connect with. Um, So it's just absolutely fascinating to, to hear about all those connections. And, you know, talking about prison, this leads perfectly into the next question because um, Ben's organizing efforts and the efforts of, of the, the Wobblies in general got them, you know, indicted and sent to prison for, for years. Can you talk about this indictment and this trial as well as how he spent his years inside prison? Of course. So in 1917, um, the United States declared war against Germany. But remember, the war began in 1914. Right. Um, And so the quote unquote great powers of Europe had already been killing each other for for three years. Right. Um, The Wobblies had taken a very principled rhetorical stance against World War One when it began. Um, Notoriously European socialists in many countries, um, socialists being, of course, an internationalist vision. sort of betrayed socialism, one could argue, by voting with their nations, right? So that German socialists ended up killing French socialists, right? How ironic. Um, Eugene Debs, most famously, was the one who criticized um, the United States and said, you know, working class people are being asked to fight, kill, and die on behalf of something that they really have no interest in. Um, However, in 1917, the U.S. does declare war. President Woodrow Wilson at the time claims that it's going to make the world safe for democracy. Um, The Wobblies didn't take an official stance against the war. Um, By contrast, the Socialist Party actually took a principled stance against the war. Um, The IWW, led by Haywood at that time, was afraid, rightly so, that the war could be a weapon used against radicals like the IWW um, conveniently. And so sure enough, um, shortly after U.S. declares war, Congress passes something called the Espionage Act. They subsequently pass another law called the Sedition Act. And these laws basically criminalize dissent, which is to say, if you disagree with World War I and America's involvement and you speak about it or write about it, you can be, uh, you are committing a federal crime. And so um, the Wobblies were already anti-capitalist and a thorn in the side of the American power structure. And these laws, the Espionage and Sedition sedition Acts, are first used against the IWW. And so the laws are passed in June of 1917. Um, Immediately, we have records of the Department of Justice spying on and investigating wobblies across the country, including Ben Fletcher, right? Um, At that time, he was living in Boston, having fled from Norfolk, having been threatened with a lynching. And so he actually was living in Boston in the summer of 17 when when, when federal agents find him, if you will, right? Um, in, the su- in the fall of 1917, the U.S. Department of Justice issues indictments against 166 leading Wobblies, including Fletcher and five other Philadelphians. Most people are um, arrested and then released on bail. Um, Fletcher actually knows he's been indicted, but doesn't have a desire to go to prison. He doesn't hide or anything like that. He doesn't run, but he doesn't turn himself in. Um, he though goes back to his home city of Philadelphia and gets a job working for the Pennsylvania Railroad in, in Philly. Um, but it takes the federal government four months to find him. Um, and when they find him, he's arrested. He's put into prison. After several weeks, he's released on bail. And then he basically goes to Chicago in the spring of 1918, where he is um, put on trial with approximately 100 other IWW leaders, including some other Philadelphians, um, in a mass federal trial. Why Chicago? Chicago was the founding place and headquarters of the IWW. 
And so over the course of the spring and summer of 1918, the longest trial in the history of the United States up until that time, I believe, um, 100 people tried. Uh, basically, they're tried for their words, their beliefs, not really for any actions. There's no evidence that the IWW hindered the war effort. Um, in fact, dock workers in Philadelphia loaded ships that were going to American and allied forces in France. Um, so after four months, everyone, including Ben Fletcher, in under an hour is found guilty on all counts. And so Fletcher and everyone else is found guilty of five counts of basically espionage and sedition and sentenced to 10 to 30 years in prison with 10 to $30,000 fines. Fletcher gets 10 years and I forget 20 grand. Um, and very then immediately um, they're put back into Cook County Prison, which is still the largest prison in the United States of America. It's also where the Haymarket martyrs were in prison before execution. Um, they were put on a big train and uh, sent to Leavenworth, Kansas, in the eastern Kansas, um, where the United States had its first and most notorious federal penitentiary. And then Fletcher and others were, um, well, served a varied amount of time, 10 to 20 year sentences. They all, most of them ended up serving approximately four years. Fletcher served two and a half years of a, during a four year period because he was released on bail in between, uh, or bond, I should say, while he was imprisoned, as were many other wobblies temporarily. Um, and so he's released actually in 1922, finally. And then subsequently, um, he and others were, had their sentences commuted, and then in the 30s, pardoned. Um, so Fletcher spent um, like 1918, the end of 18, 19, 19, 1920, parts of 21 and 22 in Leavenworth, along with many others, including, you know, famous radicals like Ricardo um, Torres Magón, right, uh, one of the sort of Mexican anarchist revolutionaries who was also um, played very nicely with the Wobblies, but also even there were black soldiers who were imprisoned in Leavenworth because they had been found, um, well, it's a complicated story, but in Houston 1917, a bunch of black American soldiers killed a bunch of Houstonians and then were um, some were executed and others were imprisoned. And so Fletcher would have hung out with um, black soldiers who had been put into prison for life, quote unquote, common criminals, i.e. people who might have committed, um, say, murder, right? Uh, but then also all these radicals um, who wrote a newspaper, who would have meetings, who would talk, et cetera. Um, the evidence from the correspondence suggests that Fletcher didn't change his political views simply because he was imprisoned for them. Yeah. Yeah, incredibly interesting. And again, this this long history in the U.S. of of using various crises as doorways through which to crack down and criminalize any form of dissent, always disproportionately falling on the heads of not only left wing people but specifically radicals uh, in in the communities of color, um, as we as we as we all know. Um, and right now, you know, in fact, one of the most likely trajectories that we're already seeing sort of bipartisan agreement about in the wake of the fascist riot on Capitol Hill is this immediate move just to solve the problem, quote unquote, solve the problem by this radical expansion of the police state. Biden has already put out um, various things, you know, indicating that that's the direction that he wants to take this in. And this very well could turn into, depending on what happens in these last couple of weeks, uh, specifically with, with Trump and, and how um, the fascist reactors already, for example, uh, talk on, on far right wing um, forums on the Internet that January 17th or even the inauguration day or leading up to it could be other, you know, f um, the, the other riots, insurrections, etc. And, you know, we can see already some of the the charges being handed down. The guy that, that sat in Pelosi's desk, for example, that independent contractor I was talking about earlier, has is now charged with um, various charges that amount to a maximum penalty of one year in prison. And we can see in this instance um, where somebody like Ben Fletcher, who really did literally nothing wrong, um, spent years in prison, and he was lucky to, to do that and not spend much more. So I think one of the big things we have to look forward to as people on the left is how the liberal center will will formulate this this expansion of, of state violence and the carceral state in ostensible reaction to right wing violence, but in practice it will be carried out in in ways it's always been carried out, which is disproportionately used to to attack, criminalize, imprison, and hound people on the left, specifically black organizers and brown organizers. Do you think that that's more or less correct as a as a historian with the long view? <laughs> 
Yeah, well, like, I mean, I hear you and I, I largely agree. I mean, I think about, like, we want to sort of separate tactics and ideology somewhat, right? I think about the occupation of the Wisconsin State Capitol in 2011 when the state of Wisconsin was trying to, and successfully ultimately, uh, eliminated workers, public workers' right to unionize, right? Um, yeah. uh, that occupation was celebrated on the left as it should have been, in my opinion. Um, the idea that, uh, so the occupation of the, the Capitol isn't inherently wrong. I mean, right. uh, the Madison was a peaceful occupation, um, but you know, like, um, nevertheless, the victims of government persecution have been, as you said, time and again, including in our times, disproportionately those on the left. I mean, there's people in prison right now for protesting this summer against racism and police killings. And we can only hope that people who sort of actually wanted to overthrow the democratic um, state will also serve very long prison sentences. <laughs> you know, even uh, you know, it's also as someone who used to live in DC, it's amazing that it was so easy, you could say, to sort of get in. Um, it's a beautiful thing, right, that a democratic institution is actually open to the people. Um, and it's a, it's a, it, 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 it's, it will not surprise me that the Congress is going to be much harder to access as an ordinary person. Um, maybe for, because of this fear, but nevertheless, um, you know, the idea that we have to uh, sort of basically create a police state in order to protect democracy is surely a sort of a path we don't want to go down. Yeah, absolutely. And we, we saw we saw what happened after 9-11. And um, we always have to be aware that that's a very possible and likely uh, trajectory. Also want to mention the J-20 protesters, people who, you know, in the wake of Trump's inauguration protested, they were rounded up randomly, you know, and they were charged with heavy charges, some of them facing literally 80 years in prison just for being in the area where windows were smashed. And we can already see the the, the, the difference in charges when it comes to, to these people so far. And I also want to uh, emphasize that point you made is like, you know, people storming the, the Capitol um, is not an inherently negative thing. It's it's the intention behind it and what you do with it. Like if you're storming the Capitol because you want to increase in equality and justice, you want to take serious action on climate change, you want to root out corruption in our government and, and expand the ability for people to democratically engage with their government, that's very different than doing that exact same action on behalf of keeping a shitty con man millionaire in office for four more years, even though he lost. So... Uh, I, I think that's an important distinction to make, if only because um, people who want to maintain the status quo will, will muddy the water around that distinction and act as if it, it's absolutely sacrilege to even think about holding people in power accountable. Um, and they'll use this as an example um, of why it's always bad in every instance. And we should at least make those distinctions and say intentions and actions and the, the forces that you're marshalling um, do matter, and and that should be the the main distinction, not just the act itself. So um, I, I yeah. appreciate you pointing that out. I would just add one more thing, which is that for for the Wobblies and other people who think like the IWW, who sometimes are called syndicalists or mm -hmm. anarcho syndicalists, right? Where do we have greatest power? It's, at, it's on the job, right? Um, that was one of the key distinctions between, say, the IWW and the communists or the socialists. Um, and uh, the idea is that uh, even today, right, I mean, a, a general strike is as, as fanciful as it may seem, um, or even a strike of just a much smaller group of people um, can deliver the goods, as the Wobblies would say, um, far better than, um, say, uh, a vote, right? Um, African Americans in the early 1900s really didn't have the right to vote. Um, and many millions of European immigrants didn't actually choose to become citizens and so therefore didn't vote. Um, and so for the Wobblies at that time in Philadelphia, I'm thinking specifically, um, you know, they didn't sort of quote believe in this sort of democratic electoral tradition in the ways that we are inculcated with um, through living in America, but also if you've gone to school in, in America, where these, these sort of rituals are sort of celebrated. Um, the Wobblies believed actually that that was sort of political power only could come really through economic institutions. Um, and so that was always their focus. And that is distinct from those who choose to sort of think about creating a party, um, not necessarily endorsing one or the other, but the Wobblies very much rejected this sort of electoral approach period. They yeah. just would say that the government is already captured, right, um, by those, uh, by basically the elite, right? Um, and the fact that many rich people donate to the Democrats and support the Democrats is only further proof in this view. Yeah. yeah. 
Absolutely. Could not agree more. And just to reiterate that point, that strikes are probably the single most effective weapon that anybody on the left or in the working class movement has. And it's much more effective than protests, than riots, and much more effective than voting. And that's the task ahead of us is to try to see how we can leverage labor power to really, you know, get certain demands met and, and to move in a direction of real progress that really impacts working everyday people's lives. Um, so moving on, you know, as you said, Ben Fletcher spent a few years uh, in prison, and then I, I'm interested in the years he spent after he came out, um, how he spent that time, and then how he eventually um, passed away. Yeah, so Fletcher got back to Philadelphia after World War One. It was very different than before the war. Um, there was actually a huge wave of strikes um, in 1919, 20, 21, almost all of which were defeated. I mean, strikes that were like, for instance, included like the Great Steel Strike of 1919 with 400,000 workers, right, across multiple states. Um, Philadelphia's dock workers also engaged in workplace actions in 1920 and 22. Fletcher, of course, um, could be thrown back into prison if he's found guilty of any crimes. Um, so he's not as visible, although as far as we know, he still was very supportive of, um, but nevertheless, local aid actually was ultimately defeated by a combination of employer resistance with support from the government and uh, the rivals in the AFL. Um, so although local aid survived the war, even though its leaders were in Leavenworth, it, it by 1923, local aid's power had been broken. Um, on the waterfront, segregation returned to gangs, to workplace gangs. Um, and although later the AFL reorganized a union in what's called the International Longshoremen's Association, ILA, um, they, the shape up also had returned. And it wouldn't be until the 60s that um, the shape up would be eliminated. And it wouldn't be until the 70s, perhaps, that segregation had been eliminated. And so you're looking at a 50 year period after local aid where the material existence, but also the sort of the racial commitment of the waterfront radically shifted for the worse, right? Um, somewhere along the way, we don't know when, around 1930, 31, uh, Fletcher moved to New York City. Why? I wish I knew. Um, I don't, um, but he shows up as no later than 1931. He's interviewed. There's a wonderful interview with him in the book um, from a black newspaper in New York City called the Amsterdam News, um, which is really sort of a jewel in the book. Um, and um, he's uh, listed as, and there's other stories about him speaking in New York City, including in, on behalf of the Harlan coal miner strikers that bequeathed us the song, Which Side Are You On, right? Um, the Kentucky Mine Wars. Um, we know that he's still speaking in the early and mid thirties and committed to the Wobblies. We also know he had a stroke somewhere around 1935, um, uh, even though he was only like, mm, you know, in his, do the math theater, um, early forties. And um, that he really disappears, right? Like we don't even know, honestly, if he had regular work. We know he got married a second time to a black woman um, named uh, Clara and that mm, she was very likely the breadwinner. Um, they lived in Brooklyn for most of that time in a neighborhood called Bedford Stuyvesant, nicknamed bed -Stuy, that's sort of now widely known and as a very black place, but it wasn't before World War II. It actually became more black over time. Uh, and so he actually lived in the same neighborhood with the Dolgoffs, with E.F. Doree's widow and um, children with big Walter Neff's wife and kids. They were all lived in the same neighborhood and, and, and Fletcher um, corresponds with some people, but he really sort of remains committed to the ideas of the IWW, um, but really from the mid thirties onward is not a player. Um, that's of course in the same period when the CIO will be sort of explode and um, where the CP will become more powerful, um, where the left is really more influential than most other times in US history. Fletcher is physically unable, right? Like to sort of be a part of this. It, it sort of, to do sort of the hypotheticals, like what would Fletcher have been? Um, he, he would have only been in his forties, right? Like, could he have still been a, a real player um, in the 1930s and forties if he had been physically healthy? Yeah, um, it's possible, right? Um, we simply don't know that that didn't happen, right? Um, and then ultimately he dies in 1949 at the age of 59 after many years of, of being considered unhealthy um, and is buried in an unmarked grave in Brooklyn. Yeah, um, although a group of people um, who I know and some of whom are IWWs or people like me who are sort of fellow travelers um, are creating a campaign to sort of actually fund and create a marker um, so that uh, starting in 2021, he will be commemorated, honored um, uh, where he was buried 
um, in Brooklyn, New York. Although it, that hasn't yet happened, we're in the process of um, making that happen. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's absolutely commendable. Is there any is there any way that anybody could could help, or is that something that is just being taken care of and just takes time? Well, um, anyone who wants to find me can find me sort of easy enough. Um, but um, actually, this week, hopefully, the uh, New York City branch of the IWW will sort of create a committee that will basically take over the work that I've begun. Um, but I'm going to help. And so, like, we will be fundraising, which is to say that anyone who's listening, probably it'll still be an opportunity to donate a couple bucks. Um, we anticipate this is we're thinking about three or four or five thousand bucks, maybe, uh, which I actually am pretty confident that we will be able to raise pretty quickly. Um, and then sort of, yeah, it's sort of amazing, actually, to me when he when I learned he was buried in unmarked grave. I'm like, why? Well, I guess it's because he had no money. Right. Like <laughs> so um, he and his wife. Right. Like it's sad. Right. Um, he's but that's the story of millions of people. Right. Who are. Um, don't even have the money to bury themselves, right? Like, although his death um, was noticed, um, he actually, there was a New York Times obituary about him. Um, there was uh, write-ups in a number of different um, black newspapers in different parts of the country. Um, of course, he was written about in the IWW press um, because even though it had been decades since he had been an active leader, he was still very much loved um, um, in, uh, and some of the later ch sections of my book really speak to the um, our, um, our documents that sort of uh, speak to the memories of those who knew Fletcher best. Well, that's wonderful. And, and when you get that uh, campaign off the ground, if you want to shoot me an email and let us know how we can help, we'll definitely uh, promote that to make that absolutely happen. I think it's a, a really important and, and beautiful, beautiful thing. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so zooming in towards the end here, a couple more questions for you. And this is more personal. So for you personally, you know, what makes Ben Fletcher such an intriguing and important figure? And, and what are some maybe lesser known aspects about him and his life that, that you personally find interesting or worth noting? Yeah, so like um, Fletcher to me, well, I mean, I've devoted a lot of my life to thinking about and, and, and working on trying to sort of rescue him from obscurity, right? Like, I mean, to me, I sort of see uh, um, the disappearance of Fletcher and more importantly than this one person, right, the union that he was a part of um, uh, is sort of shocking, right? And so I, um, I, I, I've for me, it's very important. I mean, now we think about, oh, we want to sort of listen to black and brown people, indigenous people, and center them and trust them. Well, like Fletcher is, you know, I consider to be one of the greatest black Americans in the history of the country, right? Like if you've heard of A. Philip Randolph, right, who was an important black socialist and a labor leader in the 20th century, uh, Randolph loved Fletcher. He wrote repeatedly about Fletcher and praised him in, in his magazine, the, the Messenger, right? Like, um, as I mentioned earlier, if you've heard of Fred Hampton, if you've heard of Stokely Carmichael or Ella Baker, right? Like, I mean, a sort of among the pantheon of black revolutionaries, Fletcher was among them, right? That's why he was imprisoned, yeah? Um, that's why he was sort of persecuted for his beliefs, but it was only because of the effectiveness of his work, right? Um, because literally there was no evidence introduced in the trial against him. Um, as the attorney general for that part of the state of Pennsylvania said um, in 1922, when he wrote a letter to pardon, encouraging the pardoning of Fletcher, he's like, there is no evidence that this man did anything wrong, right? Um, he is simply punished for his beliefs and for the membership in the IWW, right? Like, uh, you know, as far as lesser known aspects of him, I just discovered something that's not even in the book, right? Um, because the second edition of the book is twice as long as the first edition. It's not just a sort of a reprint, right? Um, since 2007, when the original edition was published, um, people have found me and I have found more about Fletcher, fortunately. And so, um, the original book has about 50 or 60 original documents. That's the majority of the book. Um, but the new edition, the second edition, has like 125 or more documents. Um, however, even now, after the book is published weeks ago, it's, I'm still finding stuff, right? So I just learned for the first time in some like four sentence story in a, in a newspaper in New Jersey from 1912 that he was musical. Right, um, that he was part of some musical group called the Corporation. Now I could I could start to imagine what that means. Right, all we know is that. Right, um, I don't know if he was a singer. I don't know if he played an instrument. Right, I don't know why the hell this organization was called the Corporation. <laughs> yeah. Although I might guess. Right, uh, but I could be wrong. Right, like I mean, so for all I've done, um, there's more work to be done. Right, like uh, um, 
although it's harder and harder to sort of recover these sort of figures, right? Um, but, uh, you know, so one of the lesser known aspects is something that I only learned about, it's not even in the book, right? Like, uh, <laughs> wow. sort of embarrassing as it may seem. <laughs> um, and so um, for me, he's so important because he was a black socialist unionist. Um, so as you began this sort of questions with, let's, let's think about him as a labor leader, as a socialist leader, as a leader of black liberation. Um, well, Fletcher is actually a fascinating figure to understand. The only other thing I'd say about that um, before shutting up for a second is that unlike many people today, including myself, he actually took the stand that essentially a socialist revolution would end racism. Um, he didn't, he wasn't a deep intellectual thinker and he didn't write a lot about this. And so I could be wrong about actually, but based on the things that he did write, he seemed to think that basically black people, like white people, suffered from capitalism in the same ways, right? Um, he understood very well, better than I could, you know, that racism was real. Mm -hmm. um, but he was a believer in this notion that, um, you know, that you didn't need to do something, quote, special to ensure the end of racism even though he simultaneously was part of an institution that commonly centered racism. So for example, in 1921, after the Tulsa race massacre, we have evidence of a local eight having a forum where they talk about it, right? And we also have evidence in the messenger of how they white and black workers condemned what happened in Tulsa because they saw it as a workplace union issue, not just a sort of a race issue. Um, for me, I just say that that's why the term racial capitalism is so useful is because uh, I don't want to separate out these sort of strands of white supremacy and capitalism. To me, they've been inextricably linked for 400 years. Um, and therefore, um, it's a waste of our time to say which is more important or which we have to attack first. We attack both and we always think about both, right? Like, uh, um, uh, but Fletcher didn't necessarily make that sort of argument. Although at that time, that wasn't an argument made in the same ways that subsequently we've thought more about maybe these issues. Yeah. Yeah. Well, th that's incredibly interesting. And w regardless of your position on that, you know, I would just say that, you know, socialism is probably a, a necessary, but probably not sufficient um, mechanism to, to eradicate racism, but clearing the, the field of, of capitalism and, and the way it relies on racism is certainly a major monumental and essential step in that direction. And I also wanted to say, you know, genuinely, like, salute to you for keeping his memory and his legacy alive. Like, you're talking about an unmarked grave, so many documents that nobody ever really talks about. So little is known of him um, among historians, much less among left and, and black liberation fighters to this day. And so you're doing monumental work in, in keeping that legacy and that memory alive. And, and we're honored to be able to have you on and, and help promote that. Um, before I let you go, can you maybe, if you want to, maybe what we can learn today from the life and struggles of Ben Fletcher and then also where listeners can find this book and your work online? Yeah, of course. I mean, anyone who's paying attention in our times knows that racism and xenophobia are alive and well, right? Um, and that they continue to divide us, right? Like uh, that some are, on, some are uh, attacked by these ideas and some are sort of embrace these ideas. Um, and so for me, like we continue to have to put front and center um, fights against xenophobia, fights against racism, fights against sexism, fights against homophobia, transphobia, all these phobias, they just weaken us. Right? Fletcher understood this very well. Right? Um, and so for me, the most important lesson is that if you're against any of these, you have to be against all of these things. Um, and that for Fletcher in particular, but also I would tend to agree, right? And as you said a, a few minutes ago, right? Like, where do we have power, right? I mean, so if you're against these things, what can you do about it? That's really what we want to know. It's easy to be against racism. It's harder to defeat it. Um, and the answer is it's only through organization, right? Um, and so the Wobblies, of course, are loved by some, including by people who identify as anarchists. Anarchists, of course, there's a very diverse lot, right? Um, yeah. And for people who are too individualistic, I reject that, right? Um, because like we're always weaker independently or individually. And so for um, Fletcher and the lessons really, um, I say is that um, the most important thing you can do is actually join a union and then work to make that union better, right? Because there's of course, unions are very imperfect beasts. Yeah. Um, and as far as where one can um, get this book if one wishes, well, um, PM Press is the publisher and PM Press is the best way to go to ensure that 
um, the publisher of books like mine and many other awesome books continue to publish, right? Um, if this is still January 2021 right now, they have a sale on all their eBooks for a buck 99 a month. Um, uh, if you want, there's a new website as of last year called Bookshop that you can buy books online like you could at Amazon, but where you can, um, where the, the profits go to independent booksellers. Um, and you can even earmark which independent bookshop you can earmark that percentage as profit if they are already registered in the bookshop system, which thousands are, right? And so I just bought a book um, and donated the profits to Women and Children First, which is a great Chicago bookstore, right? Um, and so I also encourage people to go to their public library or school library and ask the librarians to buy the book. That way more than one person can read it. Yeah. Um, and so PM Press website, pmpress.org um, or bookshop, those are where I recommend people to purchase their books. Wonderful. And I'll link to as much of that in the show notes as possible to make it as easy for listeners to do that. And, you know, always, Peter, it's it's an honor and a uh, loving have love having you on and talking with you about the stuff I learned amazing stuff every single time you come on you always have a place here at rev left to come on and talk about anything you want anytime you want and you did mention something about the the imperfection of of unions today but their continuing necessity and i think that's incredibly important a note to, to reflect on and end on um my stepdad is a is a union steward and he he unionized his workplace in the last several years and is continuing to be a leader in the union and fighting and he's always talking to me and coming and getting some of this more historical perspective asking me questions on how he can address you know people of color in his workplace that you know because of his own background he doesn't have a lot of experience in and you know this I, I see it in my life and I see it in his life how monumental even imperfect unions how monumental of change they can make in regular working people's lives um, you know he just told me a story the other day of, of him having to fight for an indigenous woman who works there at the factory. It's a dairy plant. And, you know, her son, she was supposed to come in for an eight hour shift. When she got in, management told her, actually, you have to work 12 today. And she didn't have anything to do. Like, okay, I'm working 12 hours, I guess. But 10 hours into that shift, which is supposed to be an eight hour shift, her son calls, says that there's, um, you know, guns being shot on their block. She lives in a, in, a, in a rough, poor part of town. And she, you know, had to go home to her to her child and management wanted to to dock her a point and you know which goes into making it very hard for her to to do things like take time off uh, in the coming year and my stepdad was was you know luckily able to use the union power to fight against that and get that mark removed and, and defend her so you know this is you know a tiny little thing but to, to her and to her family it's huge and so unions are incredibly important. And one of the topics I would want to have you come back on, perhaps, if, if you wanted to or you know somebody who would be perfect for such a discussion, I really want to tackle the history of unions in the U.S. and how the capitalist state has reacted to and over time dismantled them. Um, you know, you can think of the Red Scare and McCarthyism and the purging of radical leadership. You can think of Reagan and the neoliberal era weakening unions overall. This is a long historical process, and it was in many points in time, a conscious process taken on by the by the elites, by the ruling class in government and in uh, business. And so maybe tracing that history and seeing the, the nuances of it very specifically, I think could be could be very helpful. So if you're ever interested in that, uh, definitely let me know. Just tell me when. Yeah, perfect. Uh, you'll definitely be back <laughs> on. Uh, thank you again. Yes. Um, it's an honor talking to you and we will talk again soon. Thank you so much. And to everyone listening on this awesome podcast, Rev Left, um, thank you for your attention. I appreciate it so much.